Today in Berlin we launched a new report entitled Migration in West and North Africa and across the Mediterranean. And in a few moments you are going to hear from six of the experts who are involved in contributing to this study. They're going to be speaking about four su subjects. Firstly, they will discuss what kind of evidence and data are available to inform policy and programming in these countries. Secondly, we're going to hear about some new research which looks at some of the risks that migrants face uh, during their journeys through different parts of Africa. Thirdly, we're going to discuss questions relating to uh, migration and its impact on development. And lastly, we're going to look at some of the policy responses in the various countries along the central Mediterranean route to see how those countries have responded to some of the risks that migrants face but some, also some of the opportunities that migration presents for those interested in promoting development. Thank you very much, Frank. So what I'm going to do uh, in the next few minutes is I'll quickly run you through the various sections of the volume and highlight what are some of the key findings from each of the four sections. The report does not only showcase or represent what we as IOM know, uh, and this was an incredible team effort involving about 50 different contributors across international organizations, civil society, migrant associations, working north and south of the Mediterranean and covers mainly the period between January 2018 and December 2019 before COVID hit. So uh, what we decided to do in the spring and in the summer is include a dedicated chapter on the impact of COVID-19 on migration in Western North Africa and across the Mediterranean and add also some related uh, COVID adaptations throughout the volume. So the first section uh, covers key migration trends. We have a discussion about the sources of data. So most of the content actually presented in this volume is based on data collected by IOM's displacement tracking matrix and our colleagues in the field and also by uh, the mixed migration center. But we also have other sources of data, national statistics. There's a discussion also about the potential of new data sources such as Facebook uh, data, for instance, to estimate stocks of international migrants in African countries, or, and also open source data and what it can tell us uh, potentially about future migration trends, particularly when it comes to asylum-seeking movements uh, to Europe, and that's uh, work from our colleagues at uh, EASO, the European Asylum Support Office. So what are some of the key findings? Well, actually, if we look at migrant stocks, migration from Africa is relatively low, particularly in terms of immigration. Um, we're talking about 1.6% of the total population in countries in West and North Africa. Uh, but also uh, in terms of emigration, which is uh, moderate, but still relatively limited. Um, in terms of reasons for migration, we have a discrepancy between the reasons given by migrants interviewed by our DTM colleagues and MMC colleagues uh, in West and North Africa for the reasons to migrating, with a prevalence of migrating for job opportunities, seeking better livelihood opportunities, uh, joining family members, and the reasons given by migrants as a arrival uh, after the Mediterranean crossing, which points to the fact that uh, the reasons for migrating initially may have been different and the migrants find themselves in very vulnerable situations in countries uh, of transit or first destination. We have also a section on um, risks, uh, on risks related to migration in these regions, the individual as well as the contextual factors that explain the likelihood of being exposed to certain types of risks. And in terms of some of the key findings in this section, um, we have in particular that the socioeconomic characteristics of migrants and some of the conditions on the journey really affect the exposure to specific types of risks and also the age and level of education and whether people are traveling with family members and duration of the journey are all factors that um, have an impact on the exposure to risk. One of the key findings is also that we need to look at the complexity of migrant smuggling as a phenomenon and while yes migrant smuggling is a crime against states it is also and sometimes the only livelihood opportunity available to many communities in key countries in uh, Africa and it responds to a demand also for services by migrants wanting to cross borders and having no other possibilities or um, opportunities to do so for lack of safe 
and regular alternatives. And we also have a discussion of uh, the risks posed by policies established by countries. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the increased politicization of search and rescue operations in the Mediterranean, the support provided by the EU to the Libyan Coast Guard and Navy with interceptions and returns to Libya, which are highly problematic because they expose migrants to arbitrary detention, deportation, abuse and human rights violations. The third section of the report focuses on migration and development. This section in particular deals with emigration and immigration and how they could contribute to, uh, or they do contribute, to economic and human development. So we have some country perspectives, again here, aspects of return and reintegration, sustainability of reintegration, based also on IAM's work as part of the safety, support and solutions program. And finally, the fourth section deals with uh, migration governance and policy and programming responses. So we have a discussion here of the national, regional and trans-regional policy frameworks affecting migration in these regions. Uh, we have a discussion of diaspora policies which are on the rise and the inclusion of uh, emigrants in uh, the way uh, countries think about their citizens and their citizens abroad and what it means to development. The fact that there is a parallel sort of development in terms of on the one hand a tightening and uh, increasing tightening of external border controls in countries on the central Mediterranean route and at the same time a, a, a tendency to sort of uh, highlight the free movement areas and expand the framework of rights and uh, included in these free movement uh, agreements in countries in these regions. And chapters in this section also include discussion of public opinion on migration in countries on the, in West and North Africa as well as IAM's projects to foster social cohesion uh, and the impact also of awareness raising campaigns on the risks of irregular migration, uh, as, uh, which has also been uh, part of this uh, program uh, funded by the UK Foreign uh, Commonwealth and Development Office. So we'll have more detailed presentations about some of the chapters in uh, each of the four sections uh, shortly, so I will stop here. I wanted to really thank all the colleagues who worked really hard to make the publication possible and all the reviewers for their valuable feedback. Really big thanks. Thank you, Frank and Marcia for the introduction. This edited volume makes an important contribution to the evidence and research base that is being created under the auspices of the FCDO funded Triple S2 program Safety Support and Solutions, which is currently in its second phase. Under this program, IOM has been working together with other partners to identify and provide essential humanitarian services to migrants particularly vulnerable migrants traveling along the central Mediterranean route in whichever direction that they are moving, whether it's south to north, north to south, or interregionally. A fundamental aspect of this program has been building an evidence and research base to better understand and target our work better. And in that vein, we have been documenting migration dynamics uh, along the route through the displacement tracking matrix, better understanding vulnerabilities through the Mixed Migration Centers 4MI, and supporting the vital collection of data around the lives of those that are so unnecessarily lost in the Mediterranean under the Missing Migrants Project. We've also been building the capacities of governments and other migration stakeholders in the Western Central Africa region and the MENA region to better utilize the data that they have at their disposal for more effective and relevant policy making. Under outcome four of the program, we've been undertaking a large scale research project to understand better the decisions that migrants make and the influence, if any, that development interventions have, such as the creation of livelihood opportunities on those decisions. This volume brings together some valuable insight on the complex relationship, for example, between migration and development and explores the interlinkages in countries along the central Mediterranean route. The Triple S2 program has been about promoting partnership and sharing learning uh, so that we can deliver services better to migrants and communities along the central Mediterranean route. In that spirit, 
the edited volume has not only brought in contributions from the other Triple S2 partners, but also key civil society actors and scholars and academics alike. What makes this volume particularly unique is the contributions by scholars from the global south. And given the gender dynamics of migration and heightened vulnerabilities by female scholars. As we know, there has been a deficit of empirical evidence on migration and related issues in Western North Africa, limiting the possibility of reaching a more in-depth and nuanced understanding of the migration dynamics at play and to inform effective policy making. I look forward to hearing contributions from colleagues who have contributed to the volume today and uh, look forward to reading the edited volume. Thank you. The greater public and probably politicians remains largely misinformed about migration in North and West Africa. Media reports too often convey an implicit notion that African migration is massive, that migration is a predicament, not a blessing, that it must be contained, not promoted, etc., etc. So what do we know? The first source of knowledge comes from population censuses and surveys African states have conducted in the last decade. They deliver a picture of how many migrants there are originating in what countries and with what individual characteristics. Several features emerge. First, Western and Northern African states are neither origin nor destination of huge migratory movements. On the contrary, immigrants represent only 1.6% and immigrants 3.4% of their combined population, which is below the world average of 3.5%. Second, there is considerable diversity in Africa. North African countries have been for decades major migrant sending countries, mostly to Europe. Migration is a dimension of the relationship between the Maghreb and Europe. On the other side, apart from Libya, these countries are not host to any sizable immigrant population. By contrast, West African countries are at the same time origin and destination of mostly regional migration. Migration is for them an outstanding form of regional integration. Third, Cote d'Ivoire and Libya are major destinations for African migrants, with immigrants representing 25% of its resident population twice as much as in an average EU country, Côte d'Ivoire compared with leading countries of immigration in other continents. The situation in Libya is more confusing. Before 2011, the country was, like the big oil producing states of the Middle East, the major employer of migrant workers. At present, despite the political chaos, it still attracts several hundreds of thousands of foreign workers and also migrants in transit for Europe. Fourth, the vast majority of African migrants currently present in other African states are locally employed. They are not in transit for Europe. Fifth, analysis of European data shows that most immigrants from Africa came by air with a visa. Those entered by sea with no visa are a minority. There is much more we would need to know but cannot find using national data. How many people are moving at any moment in time? In other words, how big are migratory flows? From where to where? Under what status? Using what means? Exposed to what risk? Etc. Etc. Data collected on the ground by IOM's Displacement Tracking Matrix, DTM, and the Mixed Migration Monitoring Mechanism Initiative for MI bring a crucial contribution to the quantitative and qualitative knowledge of mobility, displacement and migration in North and West Africa. For example, from the many rounds of DTM Libya, one can extract detailed information about changes in migrant numbers from one round to the next by administrative region in the country, citizenship of the migrants, etc. No administrative system would provide this. Another kind of unique information comes from data foreign MI collects among smugglers about their incentives 
their links to state and non-state actors, and the way they operate on the ground. Before listening to presentation by authors from DTM and 4MI, I would like to highlight a characteristic of both systems of data collection. For obvious reasons of limited means, data collected by DTM and 4MI cannot be representative of the whole migrant population. In particular, for lack of means to cover the entire territory, DTM and 4MI operate in selected places, such as strategic transit hubs, points with the high concentration of displaced people, or busy border crossings. By doing so, they provide an incomplete picture, but at the same time, they gather information about migrants, their experience, history, and plans that no other system provides. Another difference with state-run statistical systems is the use of respondents. Because the entire population of people on the move cannot be interviewed, they are too many. Selected individuals in the population or external informants respond on behalf of the migrants. Again, this provides access to a kind of qualitative information that no official statistical system collects. A particularly interesting kind of information collected on the ground is the reason why people migrate. Among migrants interviewed in Africa, job seeking, family and study are the main motivations why fleeing conflict or persecution and searching international protection do not emerge as frequent causes. By contrast, the need for protection is the most common motive declared by African migrants who arrived irregularly in Europe after having crossed the Mediterranean Sea. The discrepancy between reasons given in Africa and those given once in Europe informs, among other things, on how plans may change during the journey due to conditions faced along the route. I will have much more to say about what we already know about migration in West and North Africa, but my time is now exhausted. Thank you. I'd like to present for you the chapter contribution towards the first section of the edited volume on key migration trends. So this is trends and evolving patterns along the central and western Mediterranean routes. We had two main questions we wanted to approach. The first one being what were major monthly trends in arrivals, um, specifically in the period between 2018 and the first half or January to June of 2019. And this is um, registered arrivals of migrants and refugees. Um, and the second question that we wanted to address was, are there signs of potential shift or rerouting um, between two routes over time? And the specific routes that we were looking at were the Western Mediterranean route, um, which is arrivals to Spain in the context of this chapter, and also the Central Mediterranean route, which was arrivals to Italy within the context of this chapter. So to give you a bit of uh, background context, um, in which the analysis of this arrivals data is taking place. Um, we want to mark that um, 2015 marked the highest number of registered arrivals of migrants and refugees to Europe um, in comparison to subsequent years, which saw um, a declining trend. So just keep in mind that this is against the backdrop, our analysis of a declining trend um, up to the first half of uh, 2019 in this chapter. Um, also for a bit more context, uh, we'd like to make a note that the Eastern Mediterranean route, or the EMR, uh, was the most active um, of the three routes, um, specifically in this period under review in our chapter. However, we chose to focus on the WMR and the CMR specifically because um, some of that evidence or the signs of potential rerouting among uh, certain nationalities was more apparent over time between these two routes. Um, and finally, as a last contextual note, we want to point out that between the start of 2017 and August 2019, over 90% of migration flows in West and Central Africa, WCA, were interregional or within the same country. Um, and please just uh, be aware that these data don't represent the total mobility patterns 
um, into Europe. So when we talk about total monthly trends within and possible changes over time within the specific uh, period of review, uh, the key note worth highlighting is that uh, in contrast to 2017, um, the CMR uh, shifted from being um, the more active route than the WMR um, by mid-2018. So to contextualize that, between the second half of 2018 and up to June 2019, overall migration trends along the CMR and the WMR show a higher number of arrivals to Spain than to Italy in most months, and that is in comparison to 2017. Now, as Marzia had pointed out um, in her introduction of the launch, uh, most of these contributions were uh, contributed prior to much of the restrictions of COVID-19. So we'd just like to point out that trends after June 2019 um, have continued to evolve. And since the start of 2020, Italy now receives more arrivals than Spain. And now just to quickly dig into those key findings of the second question that was raised in our chapter, um, any indications of potential rerouting of certain nationalities over time. Um, within our period under review, we did indeed find evidence of potential indications of this rerouting um, observed among certain migrant and refugee nationalities to Italy and Spain. And this was particularly more pronounced among Ghanaian and Malian nationals. Um, however, in the chapter itself, we also provide um, some discussion of this also being more pronounced among Senegalese and Ivorian nationals as well, um, noting that nationality is as declared um, by the migrants and refugees. Now, again, reiterating in the context that um, in this time period under review, over 90% of these flows um, were within WCA were interregional or um, within country. So the graph that you see on this slide um, is simply as an example illustration for you so that you can um, possibly see um, in a visual way how this rerouting is uh, somewhat evident between 2017 um, up to the first half of June 2019. Um, but as I want to keep within my time limits, I'll quickly um, finish my portion uh, with some closing messages, um, just emphasizing that, again, this was a very specific um, time frame under review in our chapter. So a lot can still be said of ongoing um, evolutions and trends uh, post June 2019 and certainly after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as we see that um, this COVID-19 pandemic has also impacted um, the mobility of migrants and refugees. So I encourage you to look at the resources um, on our various web platforms, as well as the chapter on COVID-19 and the volume itself for more context there. Um, and all of this is to say that what's really important to, um, to value is that analysis on trends offer the data that's needed to inform humanitarian agencies and authorities um, to adopt uh, better programming and context-specific analysis uh, and just bearing in mind that mobility trends, as I mentioned, um, along the CMR and the WMR are frequently changing, um, so do require constant monitoring. And thank you very much. I believe that's all of my time, and I'm happy to pass on to my fellow presenters. Protection violations in Libya have been extensively documented by organizations like OHCHR, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and a recent MMC and UNHCR joint report launched just this summer provides an overview of the extent of violations that refugees and migrants face across Libya. But with this chapter, which is based on a more extended MMC study, we wanted to examine what determines vulnerability and what are the characteristics of refugees and migrants or, or strategies uh, that they're undertaking that might be making them more vulnerable to protection violations and abuses. And when I say protection violations, I'm including sexual uh, or physical abuse, robbery, kidnapping, detention, and even death. But this study draws on more than 5,600 surveys collected by MMC with refugees and migrants in Libya through our global data collection project called 4MI, discussed extensively so far. 
Uh, surveys were collected by enumerators who are refugees and migrants and have unique access to people on the move. And for our chapter on smuggling along the CMR, we use data from more than 300 interviews. With, uh, so to build our, our model for what determines protection, we draw a lot on the vulnerability work already carried out by our IOM colleagues. And, and this allowed us to test a number of hypotheses uh, about gender, uh, age, uh, how one interacted with smugglers in, uh, in determining vulnerability. So we'll split up these findings into, into three areas, factors or, or characteristics that are associated with greater vulnerability, factors or measures that seem to mitigate vulnerability, and where we didn't see evidence of any impact. So first, uh, in terms of factors that increase vulnerability, we found in our sample that refugees and migrants from Chad, Eritrea, and Nigerians were particularly uh, vulnerable to protection abuses in Libya. We also found that, that women were more vulnerable to sexual abuse, but for all other protection violations, men appeared more, more vulnerable. Younger respondents were more vulnerable, and those refugees and migrants who worked along the route to finance steps of the journey versus those who used digital means to secure money or carried the cash that they need uh, were, were more vulnerable, and as well as the way that they paid smugglers. So paying smugglers through work seemed to make our respondents more vulnerable. This is as opposed to uh, working out a payment modality with your smuggler where you would pay at, uh, upon safe arrival or paying half uh, at departure and, and another half on arrival. That seemed to be a strategy that actually mitigated the vulnerability of our, of our respondents. And accessing money through digital money transfer to finance the various steps of the journey was another uh, mitigation measure. And where we didn't see any evidence of impact was with respect to, to religion uh, or, or carrying cash. So to bring in some of our, our insights from the smuggling chapter, we found that more than two thirds of the people that we, we spoke to in Libya and a half in West Africa reported using a smuggler on their journey. And refugees and migrants in North Africa were more often encouraged to move by a smuggler than those in West Africa who were more often encouraged to move by friends or family. And that smugglers in Libya are among the main perpetrators of protection violations. And in West Africa, 9% of protection abuses were or contributed, were perpetrated by smugglers. So to close now with the few seconds I have left, based on these two chapters, we've come up with a few key recommendations. So first for programming, the importance of using a roots-based approach to develop and implement protection uh, programming. So, so moving out of this single country focus, consider options for digital cash programming and devise information campaigns along the route on safer migration options and practices and make information shareable on social media because elsewhere in our four MI data, we see how important social media and the internet is for, for obtaining information about the journey. For, for policy, engaging local civil society actors and Libyan authorities to promote a domestic legal framework for refugees and migrants that focuses on uh, protection irrespective of legal status. And the fact that smugglers have different profiles, which warrants a more nuanced policy approach that moves beyond criminalization and the distinction between people on the move and their smugglers is less clear cut than the way it's often portrayed in public discourse and anti-smuggling policies. And of course, expanding research and data collection on refugee and migrant protection in Libya, particularly with respect to designing longitudinal studies. Thank you very much. And I will now pass it off to Laura. In my five minutes, I'd like to share what uh, we have been doing uh, at DTM in Europe and in particular uh, what we have been doing, monitoring flows and arrivals and updating profiles to those reaching Italy, Greece, Spain and other European countries over the past five years. And overall, what we wanted to do was to look at the individual risk factors and contextual conditions at origin in transit countries and a destination that might have determined higher or lower levels of um, vulnerability along the journey for, for these migrants. And in particular, I wanted to understand whether there are different characteristics uh, associated to different routes for migrants and uh, which are the most prevailing factors uh, associated with um, 
vulnerability to a selected set of experiences of abuse, violence and exploitation. Um, as you see in the next slide, um, overall uh, a share between 66 and 77 percent of respondents each year has answered yes to at least one of four indicators that we have included in the survey, uh, specifically so individual experiences of forced work, having been held uh, against will, having been uh, work without payment and having been offered an arranged marriage. Overall, what we found is that uh, um, age and sex um, affect the probability of experiences this kind of experience uh, of, of abuses uh, with younger and male respondents being more vulnerable to uh, experiences of unpaid or forced work and of being held against will. And also we saw that uh, the vulnerability of migrants to this set of indicators uh, has increased over time, so between 2016 and 2018, and especially for those traveling through Libya um, against all the others that, that didn't pass through uh, that country, and for those originating um, in Western Africa and the Eastern Horn of Africa compared to other regions of origin. I think the, the analysis that we have been doing uh, provides us with many suggestions on how to best deal with uh, the central Mediterranean routes and uh, managing migration along that route. Uh, complementing what Ayla just said, uh, regular migration channels are not available for many prospective migrants uh, at present um, from Africa and elsewhere to Europe. Of course, uh, looking at the Mediterranean more specifically, we are lacking a comprehensive mechanism of um, uh, search and rescue and disembarkation uh, at the European level, which is putting uh, more uh, risks uh, on the shoulders of those crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, and also there is clearly more room for uh, a comprehen comprehensive protection system for those reaching Italy at the end or other European countries, uh, which who are all survivors of these uh, dangerous routes. Uh, for programming aspects, of course, we need uh, to, and looking again to Europe, because Isla covered more what happens before Europe, uh, maybe we need to be very specific in distinguishing the risk uh, associated um, with men, women and children in terms of abuse uh, and exploitation, violence and trafficking, of course. And we need to have a route-based approach, understanding the differences that different routes entail, and a human rights-based approach, because there are many um, that are still falling through the cracks of the existing protection system uh, in, in European countries in general. And for research uh, avenues in the future, of course, there is a lot of possibilities to connect micro level studies as ours uh, on both sides of the Mediterranean. And maybe more interesting uh, is even the possibility to connect this micro level evidence with policy changes in Europe, in the partner countries and in transient countries, because this can allow us as humanitarian actors to understand uh, how the changes are happening along these routes and how the needs also of uh, the migrants are changing and how different groups might become uh, more or less vulnerable while traveling towards Europe. I stop here, but I'm happy to, to reply to more questions maybe in the end. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I present to you our presentation on migration across West Africa, development related aspects. Um, myself, Peter Corte, Mary Centrana, and then Cynthia Rupi Table. The impact of migration is felt at different levels. We argue that no matter the level of development countries in West Africa could reach, their citizens will still migrate, although the motives, the volume, and impact may differ. The net benefit of migration, in our view, is positive if it's well managed. The institution of ECOWAS in the adoption of his protocols on free movement of persons have indeed facilitated the development exchanges among member states. So the key question with us is 
What are the linkages between migration and development in the West African sub-region? Uh, we use IOM data source, we use World Bank and UN uh, agencies data. So key four key tenets of our presentation are the issue of brain drain, brain gain, transnational linkages and return migration, impact of remittances on development, migration associations and development, migrants' contribution to development. Now let me turn to brain gain, brain drain, etc. The negative perception of migration, which stems from the features of brain drain, has been again following contemporary migration within the West African region. Due to its transactional nature, West African migration and its migrants are able to contribute their acquired skills to the development of the home country, either on temporary or permanent return basis. Migrants certainly establish businesses in their home country. They create jobs for the left behind family. Uh, we have shown in the, in the chat uh, remittances and high supplementing household income. They are invested in accommodation, health, education, among others. More than half of West African countries' remittances uh, represent at least 5% of their gross domestic product, as we can see. Um, in terms of migrant associations and development, we notice that West African migrants form associations along the lines of their profession, their religion, and ethnicity, among others. Diaspora associations can be found in the USA, Canada, UK, Netherlands, Germany, to mention but a few. These associations contribute infrastructure development, such as schools, hospitals, in their home country. They also support newly arrived migrants to integrate into the host country. Um, migrants uh, help in developing their home country businesses, creating employment, and many others. They also help to contribute to us cultural diversity in the host country. So you can see in the chat uh, some local food items sold in the international uh, market. In conclusion, migration within and outside West Africa sub-region brings enormous benefit to both the home and the host countries, especially if it is well managed. We therefore recommend that government in the sub-region should harmonize migration policies across the region to maximize its benefits while reducing the cost of migration, be it regular or irregular. We also encourage governments under the SDG indicators 10 and 17, respectively, uh, to increase the volume of remittances by reducing the cost of remittances. We also recommend that increased educational awareness on the dangers of irregular migration and the need to promote regular migration, which leads to development. Thank you very much. Most states in West and North Africa and in Europe are part of free movement areas. However, borders remain important. In this presentation, we are going to look at how trends towards lifting into regional border controls and towards tightening external border controls have coexisted in the last years and, and how they have influenced regional and transregional migration governance in West and North Africa and in Europe. Most states um, in these three regions are part of free movement areas. In the economic community of West African states, um, the protocol on free movement of persons uh, on uh, the right of residence and establishment um, has been adopted already in 1979 uh, and, and free movement policies um, were later mainstreamed in other policies of the region, such as the common approach uh, on migration of the ECOWAS. In the European Union uh, as well, the um, free movement of person was already enshrined in the Treaty of Rome and has later been um, mainstreamed also and consolidated also by the Treaty of Maastricht and uh, by the Schengen Agreement. In uh, West Africa and uh, in Europe, um, uh, free movement policies have contributed to facilitate uh, mobility within regions, um, which is much more prevalent than mobility between regions. Um, they have also um, testified to a political recognition that um, this mobility is essential for uh, social and economic uh, integration and for uh, development. Um, 
In North Africa, uh, free movement uh, was foreseen by the treaty establishing uh, the Arab Maghreb Union, uh, but related policies have yet to be adopted. Um, at the continental uh, level as well, um, uh, will to extend free movement policies exist, and it has been uh, present in the work of the African Union since the beginning. Um, two weeks ago, in 2018, it has gained momentum uh, with the adoption of the protocol on uh, free movement of persons and the right of residence and establishment. Um, however, national borders remain important. Um, in fact, divergent interests at the national level have rendered it sometimes difficult to advance on the implementation of free movement policies um, and to agree on migration governance uh, within free movement areas. Um, these national differences have been uh, partially related to socio-economic uh, divergences between member states um, and to um, different migration-related uh, interests um, that have been linked to um, different aspects uh, such as um, demographic trends, um, uh, different migration and remittance uh, flows, um, labour market needs or geographical locations. Um, the impact can be seen in North Africa, for example, where, um, as we already mentioned, um, they have um, hindered uh, um, or slowed down the progress on uh, free movement uh, policies um, and their adoptions. Uh, in the ECOWAS, um, they have uh, so far hindered the full implementation of the Protocol of uh, 79. And in the European Union, they have um, um, rendered it difficult for member states um, to agree on um, migration governance uh, within the Union. And they have uh, um, led member states uh, to progressively increase their efforts uh, on, the, on immigration control at the external border of the Union. So, and these simultaneous trends towards lifting intra-regional uh, border controls um, and um, tightening uh, controls at the external borders um, have uh, led to interregional dependencies in migration policy negotiations. Um, in particular, uh, we see that migration governance in West and North Africa has been increasingly influenced by policy negotiations inside the European Union. This has taken place both directly from interregional inter policy negotiations um, but also um, indirectly, as what is uh, negotiated uh, within one region can contribute to shift uh, the focus of the negotiations between two or more regions. Um, um, we also uh, see that transregional policy negotiator negotiations as well have not been always easy, as um, here as well we can see that there are different uh, national and regional interests um, and different competencies on migration, development and security. Um, we are now reaching the conclusion um, of this very short presentation and maybe we can move to the next slide. And um, yes, well, we have seen that the, the progressive adoption and implementation of free movement policies um, has taken place in parallel um, with a maintained importance of national borders um, and in some cases also with a trend towards uh, tightening external border controls. Um, this has influenced the, the negotiation of regional and transregional migration governance in West and North Africa and in Europe. Um, um, the socio-economic uh, consequences of the um, COVID-19 pandemic um, can be expected to have an impact on these um, policy negotiations at regional and transregional um, level as well, because they may also contribute to reshape um, national migration-related interests. To conclude, um, here in the slide, uh, you also see uh, the link to the um, chapter to, for download. Thank you. Migration governance understood as a well-defined set of rules, principles, and decision-making procedures that apply to immigrants and immigrants is recent in most of Africa. On the other side, as soon as independent states were born in the 1960s, a number of questions called for the definition of policies that became building blocks of what we now consider to be migration policies. The first question is who belongs to the national frameworks of rights and duties and who does not? Defining nationals was a founding act of all nations. All 
North and West African states adopted the principle of nationality transmission by descent. A son or daughter of a national is a national. With the passing of time, numbers of migrants grew and states had to make decisions on issues such as the right to nationality in virtue of one's place of birth, naturalization in the course of one's life, dual citizenship, etc. They brought very diverse responses to that question. Besides defining nationals, states had to decide what rights and duties non-nationals on their territory would be granted, thereby doing what we call today integration policies. The earliest immigration policy was Côte d'Ivoire declaring in 1963, land belongs to who cultivates it, a slogan which would make Côte d'Ivoire a magnet for many hundreds of thousands of West African farmers. The second question is, how do states engage with their citizens abroad? Making expatriate nationals a resource for their country of origin emerged as a common principle of diaspora policies designed by African states as early as the 1990s. Institutions linking expatriates and their country of origin were established. Special programs to attract migrant remittances and foreign direct investment were designed. The third question is how to organize national communities abroad, maintaining a sense of belonging to their nation of origin among members of the diaspora became a challenge with the rise of second generation migrants, in particular those originating from the Maghreb in Europe. States of origin took several measures, from fostering cultural links through language courses and religious education delivered to children of migrants in Europe, to recognizing political rights to non-resident nationals, including the right to elect, and in certain cases, the right to be elected. The first question is how to deal with irregular migration. In parallel with efforts to incorporate expatriate nationals into citizenry, African states have built up instruments to remove undocumented foreign nationals from their territory. Again, this is an old concern. Laws on entry and stay passed soon after independence all forced punishments for foreign nationals with unlawful status. Later on, when irregular migration and cross-border smuggling gained momentum in the early 2000s, African states defined new categories of offenses and tightened the fight against smuggling and trafficking in human beings. In 2003, Morocco became the first country to introduce a specific law against irregular migration, penalizing not only migrants with an irregular status entering or living in the country, but also undocumented migrants exiting the country and those facilitating, facilitating irregular migration. In the same period, several European states started to rely on third countries to stop undocumented migrants before they reach a European border. Negotiating readmission of migrants with an irregular status became part of broader cooperation agreements between African and European states. Many other questions would call responses resorting to migration policies, but I won't take much more of your time. Thank you. Uh, indeed, Canary Islands, um, which actually are not Mediterranean routes, so it, it's the Western Atlantic, but indeed, but we covered that, that area and we try to grasp news uh, on data and on arrivals there. Uh, from colleagues that are in uh, IOM Spain. And indeed, there has been an increase uh, of arrivals from Moroccan coasts, but also from Mauritania, uh, because we have we have been seeing different types of um, of boats uh, reaching uh, the Canary Islands. And uh, up until now, for Spain, it's, it's around 4,000 migrants uh, arrived to Canary Islands this year, uh, which makes this like 30% of total arrivals for Spain this year. And it's indeed a bit more uh, than it was last year in 2018. It's not completely new uh, because uh, there have been 
past periods, uh, looking at the past decade or 20 years ago, that, that this kind of route has been used more. Um, and we are, yes, looking at trends there and also the nationalities that, that um, arrive um, to the Canaries instead that uh, uh, traveling from Morocco to Spain uh, by, by, by sea uh, in the Mediterranean. Thank you. So we have another question, which is about what consideration was given to having a sensitive approach to data presentation, uh, the classic debate on invasion arrows on maps or and the impact of those on negative perceptions of migrants and alternatives. I can say, and perhaps also my, my co-editors would like to say something about this issue, is the entire aim of the volume is precisely that, is moving away from portraying African migration as predominantly a phenomenon of African migration to Europe and showing what is happening within Africa, within regions in Africa, and all the related aspects, the risk development and governance aspects uh, and the salient features of migration within this region. So it's, it's exactly because of that, and I think a big focus also of the Safety Support and Solutions Program is focusing on what is happening in countries on the route. Uh, so yes, we obviously, um, the program also had this part in the central Mediterranean route and what happens across the Mediterranean and, that's, uh, and that is part uh, obviously of, uh, of African migration, but it's just a small part of a much larger story that we hope uh, that has been conveyed by all the contributions uh, that we have, including contributions from our colleagues working in the field uh, and experts from the countries and regions covered by this volume. And the last thing I'm going to say about this is that we also have a, a chapter on perceptions of migrants and migration in Africa, which is usually not uh, really a topic that we talk about. Yes, there is a dearth of data, but there are. Uh, so the Gallup service and also African Barometer service covering um, this topic. And uh, and so we, we try to address what is the um, so what do people think about migration uh, in these countries? And then the big other topic would be what do people think about emigration maybe that hasn't really been addressed um, by existing surveys. And we also have a, a chapter on uh, projects implemented by IOM and other colleagues in the field about how to foster social cohesion. In our chapter, we, we make sure not to include graphs with arrows. We often step for the option of including circles which represents um, better in terms of proportion and, and overall um, data in terms of yes proportions and shares um, which we feel is a much better approach as it's more of a descriptive approach um, which is indicative of conclusions and findings but not um, presenting conclusions in, in and of themselves or conclusive statements. Um, and if you do look at um, our displacement.iom.int website, as well as the migration.iom.int and GEMDAC colleagues, I know that your platform is similar. Um, we do not opt to use maps with arrows. We do opt to use the maps with the spheres instead. So I hope that's just a very quick and concise answer. Of course, the, the map is completely misleading. And it is written in the volume itself. Uh, when, when you feature arrows starting from the Gulf of Guinea, crossing the whole of West Africa uh, to Libya, and then crossing the Mediterranean, uh, this does not go to any real migration. Of course, there are routes in Africa, but these routes are, um, are traveled from south to north, but also from north to south. Uh, these routes are separate segments of a number of diverse flows within Africa, which have absolutely nothing to do with crossing with no passport, the Mediterranean Sea. So we pay a lot of attention to this in the volume. Uh, and and I'm, I'm pretty sure that if we did a mistake on this, please, uh, let us know, but but uh, no. Uh, clearly, uh, we try to show that African migration is much more complex than the simplistic view that a number of media try to convey of 
the invasion of Europe, etc. So uh, we pay much attention to the data, to the real data, not to the invented data. Uh, reference has been made today to the Safety Support and Solutions 2 program, SSS2. When it was first designed, SSS2 was a £75 million multi-sector, multi-country humanitarian program in West and North Africa that provides protection support for people on the move, together with a range of research and data and evidence components. Recent funding reductions have lowered the overall amount, but the scope and the goal of the work remains the same. It goes without saying that FCDO's partners are crucial to the implementation of our humanitarian strategy and our programme work. And I was very happy to see that Tauhid mentioned the importance of partnerships in his opening remarks. IOM is the only partner working across all SSS2 outcomes and all focus countries, which highlights their importance as a partner. We're also very fortunate to be able to draw on the expertise that exists within the Global Migration Data Analysis Centre, GIMDAC, as part of that support. We're proud to have supported GIMDAC on specific projects over the last number of years, and in particular on the work that has gone into this edited volume. FCDO also funds data collection and analysis and research carried out by NGO partners such as the Danish Refugee Council and its Mixed Migration Centre, and we're very pleased to see the coordination that has occurred between IOM and MMC in particular. Under outcome three of SSS2, we are looking to enhance the understanding of key actors. So here I'm talking about national and international humanitarian organizations, governments and donors, of who moves and where they move, as well as the vulnerabilities and protection concerns of people on the move. This information should then feed into humanitarian decision-making in order to make people's journeys safer. The edited volume should, therefore, be an excellent tool to achieve this end. The breadth of topics covered in the volume is impressive enough in itself, and we've heard some of the detail from the speakers today. It was great to hear Ayla mention the, uh, the route-based approach, something which is the cornerstone of SSS2. The topics that are covered show the complexity of migration issues and the multi-pronged approach that migration actors must be cognizant of. The topics cover some more obvious but important areas such as data management and use, migration policy and programming, and the inherent risks people on the move face. But I believe its investigations into the development considerations of migration in particular are crucial it shows that migration issues are not short term and that humanitarian actors need to take a broader view when supporting people on the move. Coming from a donor's perspective, finally, I'd like to touch on two areas that I believe are important for the edited volume, and that is its impact and the sustainability of interventions that it, that it examines. With regard to impact, we are aware that research, excuse me, we are aware that partners working under outcome three of SSS2 face challenges in measuring the impact of data and evidence programming. Indeed, we have funded MMC to look at this exact issue, and they produced a paper earlier this year called Evidence-Based Operational Responses to Mixed Migration, Challenges and Best Practice. I would encourage all implementing partners on this webinar to use research such as the edited volume to inform both your ex existing programs and future funding applications. Evidence-based work is hugely important to FCDO and to other donors too. Finally, regarding the sustainability of SSS2 and projects such as the edited volume, we hope that through our SSS2 funding and the championing of the route-based approach, we have created a solid foundation from which to build. We hope this will lead to the continuation of this work and that it will be built upon to ensure that people on the move in North and West Africa continue to receive high quality support and assistance. <laughs>